Good morning, I'm Alexa Scott. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Maya Owens, here to look at some of the stories we'll be talking about over the next hour. Syracuse University honors the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the 50th anniversary of his death. A Maltese journalist posthumously receives the Totally Free Speech Award. Hear about her work exposing a corrupt government and organized crime. And a Newhouse alum is training upcoming TED Talk speakers, getting them prepared for their big debut on stage. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Today marks the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. To mark the event here at SU, a plaque will be dedicated tonight at the Schaefer Art Building Galleria, where Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in 1965. I had a dream is easily one of the most recognized quotes in U.S. history. Martin Luther King Jr. dedicated his life to activism and served as a le leader of, of the civil rights movement. Hendrick Chapel Dean Brian Conkle hopes the plaque will serve as a reminder of Dr. King's legacy and the work that still needs to be done. There's no better time than to pause, to reflect, and to think about what actually matters most. And thinking about the sacrifices that Dr. King made helps us to think about the sacrifices that we need to be made. The ceremony will start at 4.30 p.m. following the ceremony on the the chimes of Krauss College will ring 39 times to honor the 39 years of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. A Google spreadsheet containing the names of over 150 architects who have been anonymously accused of misconduct has been widely circulated. The list includes three current and two past SU architecture professors. Students became aware of it when it was sent through an SU listserv recently. When approached for an interview, an architecture student who asked to remain anonymous says, the school administration has advised students not to speak on the matter. The dean of the School of Architecture, Michael Speaks, sent a school-wide email saying that the university's Title IX office will be conducting a climate assessment in the coming weeks. A former SU student is suing the university after he was suspended indefinitely back in 2016. The student referred in the lawsuit as John Doe was accused of sexual misconduct. He's claiming SU's investigation was biased against him. John Doe claims Jane Rowe, his accuser, made up parts of her story and lied during the investigation. He's also blaming the university and its board of trustees for inadequate procedures. The university issued an official statement saying, quote, Syracuse University takes every alleged incident of sexual violence extremely seriously. The university's process to educate sexual assault allegations is fully guided by federal and state law. Per university policy, we do not comment on the specifics of any pending litigation. The Tully Center for Free Speech here at the Newhouse School presented its annual award last night. It was presented prominently to a Maltese journalist who was murdered last year. Our own Odea Pincus is live in the newsroom with more on the honoree and her family who accepted the prize. Thanks, Mai. For the family of Daphne Caruana Galicia, it's been a long road to justice, and it still is. But after her assassination last October, she's still receiving recognition for her groundbreaking work. I was at the Herg Auditorium here at Newhouse last night where she was presented with the award. Daphne Caruana Galizia was a Maltese journalist known for exposing corruption within her country's government. She was killed in a car bomb attack last October, shortly after leaving her home. Last night, her family came to Syracuse University to accept the Tully Award for free speech on her behalf. Her family spoke of her bravery and her commitment to making change in Malta. I don't know if she, she didn't quite there was no fear in her in any part of her body. She, uh, I don't know how to explain. She was like a force of nature. One of her sons, Matthew, has followed in her footsteps as an investigative journalist. He says that since her death, he has had to not only report, but to advocate as well. Um, there's normally a strict separation between kind of reporting and advocacy, but I think you're in circumstances like this, you're forced into a position where you just can't choose between the two. Professor Roy Gutterman presented the award to the family. As head of the Tully Center for Free Speech, he said that awarding it to Galicia was an easy choice. I think it's important to be able to send a message to the, the, the people who would endorse this sort of uh, violence against journalists to tell them that you know, the world does care 
uh, even in remote places like Syracuse, New York, um, this sort of uh, violence should not be accepted. Our sons say that they appreciate the recognition for their mother's work and they hope it continues in the future. Reporting for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Odan Pincus. It's been a rainy and cloudy week here in Syracuse and unfortunately it doesn't seem like this April, these April showers are going to end anytime soon. Let's go to Sarah Bonadies live on the weather deck with what to expect for the rest of the week. Sarah. Thank you, Maya and Alexis. Now, it's been a pretty rainy morning here on the Hill. However, the big concern today is the wind. Now, the National Weather Service has issued a high winds warning from 10 a.m. today until midnight tonight, with the strongest possible winds expected to be this afternoon into the early evening hours. But let's take a look at your five-day weather forecast. Now today you can expect a bit of a washout with rain expected to continue throughout the day. There will be a high of 54 degrees and a low of 25. Tomorrow the sun will peak through the clouds but is expected to cool down with a high of 34 and a low of 28. Your weekend will have a wintry start with snow and rain expected on Friday with a high of 46 and a low of 28. Saturday will be cloudy with a high of 39 degrees and a low of 25. And Sunday flurries are expected with a high of 34 and a low of 25 degrees. Now, the wind and rain is expected to continue throughout the day, so if you are headed outside, be sure to bring your umbrella. Reporting live from uh, Mornings on the Hill, I'm Sarah Bonnetties. Back to you. TEDx is coming to Canvas in just a few weeks. I'm so excited to hear about all the speakers that are coming, but I cannot imagine getting up in that stage in front of all those people. I know, but there's actually a Newhouse grad who trains TED speakers. And our Allison Colaguire spoke with him to find out how he gets people TED Talk ready. She joins us live in the studio with more. Thanks, Lexus and Mai. Devin Marks is the founder of MyTedTalk.com. It's the nation's first TED Talk focused speaker prep and story craft firm. He was a public relations major when he was at Newhouse and says he's used a lot of what he learned while at Syracuse in his TED training career. Devin Marks started his career advocating for a cause he believed in, lowering the legal drinking age. All it took was putting a keg on a table in a student union and we had a chapter and fervored fans. After graduation, he got a little bit more serious and went to Washington, D.C. to work as a lobbyist before going to seminary. While in seminary, Marx became interested in TED Talks. Ideas worth spreading has a little bit to do with a seminary context. So he and a professor set out to figure out what made TED Talks so popular. Why does a lecture get a million views? Marx took what he learned and started MyTEDTalk.com. Speakers come to Marx with an idea, or seven, and he walks them through a process to make their idea TED Talk ready. The process involves filtering, milling that idea into some bread that can rise or dough that can rise. Marx works with speakers from idea to outline to script to rehearsal, finally to the stage. For a talk in the TED style that you would want to be at the top of your Google results for the rest of your career, takes more than three weeks. It's a three month process and often it's a six month process. If Marx could give a TED talk, he says it would be about values and traditions as they relate to family. The talk would be based on 1700 letters he found in his family's attic in Kentucky that were written to Marx's great great grandfather by his parents. I read them in sequence as I was becoming a father and they reshaped my understanding of family and purpose and grace. Mark says that one of his favorite TED Talks was given by Dr. Robert Waldinger. It's about what it means to live a good life. Make sure you catch TEDx right here on campus on April 21st. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Allison Caliguire. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, we're heading into the future for the FAD Semester Fashion Show. We'll take a look at what the future of the fashion industry may look like. And the International Women's Month may be over, but one organization on campus continues to put the focus on all things women. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. Be Well SU is an organization on campus that encourages students' opportunities to lead a healthy life. This semester, Be Well and Syracuse University are teaming up for a special event that focuses on making women students knowledgeable about birth control, including the different kinds of contraceptives that are available. Individuals about the hormonal and non-hormonal contraceptives, as well as like the barrier methods. 
That is just one piece of information students will learn. Hendrick says there are 10 types of contraceptives and most people only know of one. The event will take place this Friday from 2 until 3 p.m. in Day Hall. MSNBC anchor and political commentator Joy Ann Reed visited the Hill last night as part of the university lecture series. The AM Joy host spoke on perplexing politics and her role as a journalist in the media. Reed is also an adjunct professor for the Race, Gender, and Media Newhouse class at SU's Fisher Center in Manhattan. Newhouse and NYC program director Cheryl Brody Franklin asked Reed to teach three semesters ago and says it has impacted the program greatly. Really brings like that punch that the program needed. It shows like that we are here and um, we are like, gaining the momentum that we um, that we need. She's such an incredible professor, an incredible talent. Newhouse NYC has various professors that are leaders in their respective industries. About 20 to 25 students attend the program every semester and intern during the day while taking classes like Reed's at night. Twitter was a popular outlet last night for Newhouse students who attended lectures by a few influential speakers. Our Gianna Astorito is live in the studio with more. The Syracuse community was on Twitter yesterday posting about appearances on campus by ESPN's Jamel Hill and MSNBC's Joy Ann Reed, who as we just mentioned is also a professor at the university. Many tweeted about their excitement and one, tweet, one student actually tweeted, was able to reconnect with my professor from last semester. Her race, gender, and the media class was one of her favorites. Another student had tweeted, excited to see my old professor, Joy Ann Reed, a literal goddess, speak in Hendricks Chapel. We also had Tula Guenka. She had tweeted that she attended yesterday at Hendricks Chapel, and there's an image here that you can see she had tweeted on her Twitter. And also, Jamel Hill had took to Twitter to say that she was happy to be at the event. And that's all for the buzz. That's all the buzz for right now. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Gianna. This past weekend, the Fashion Association of Design Students, also known as FADS, put on a fashion show. Student designers, along with others, had the opportunity to show off their work. Our Christine Morton is live in the newsroom with more. Thank you, Maya and Alexis. That's right, more than 15 students put on the show. From designing to modeling, the show was put on without a hit. More than 15 models strutted their walk at the annual FADS Semester Fashion Show this past weekend. Dim lighting, music, and various fabrics took over the runway. Titled Tomorrowland, Secretary of FADS Danielle Fenske says this show focused on a futuristic theme. And um, designs you see today on the runway in um, high fashion, a lot of it is leaning towards very um, futuristic, androgynous um, looks that are incorporating things that you might not normally use, like clear vinyl, you're seeing lots of sequins, you're seeing lots of things that might not necessarily be used, but that could be where fashion is headed. Leslie Sanchez is a model for fads. She says even her hair was used as part of the design to represent the future. So my hair, for example, is definitely um, one of the things that represents the future. It's just a futuristic thing or a futuristic way of thinking and just representing of the unknown or the uncertainty. Fenske says the advancement in technology is now beginning to reflect on fashion. People are kind of getting bored with just normal fabric and try to test out new possibilities of what fashion can do and how we can really create an art piece for the body and how we can push that limit of what a garment really is. If you happen to have missed the show this past weekend, look out for the Senior Thesis Show, which will be held later this month. Reporting live in the newsroom, I'm Christine Morton for Mornings on the Hill. As we told you earlier, the Newhouse School's Tully Center has awarded its Free Speech Award to a Maltese journalist who was murdered last year. I'm in the studio live with Mornings on the Hill reporter Odea Pincus, who covered the event. Thanks, Odea, for sitting down with me this morning. So first, tell me a little bit about this journalist. Yeah, thanks, Lana. So uh, last night was a really emotional night for both the family and uh, just for uh, reporters worldwide. It's a really important concept to know about because, you know, Dr. Carana Galizia, she was someone who 
was a real trailblazer when it came to journalism in Maltese. You know, her son said that she was one of the first, she was the first journalist to put her name on a piece of political reporting. Uh, she was the first female journalist to do the same. And she had this blog, right? And this blog was a really, really in-depth investigative journalism blog and people were trying to stop her. You might have remembered the uh, Panama Papers that came out uh, looking into a lot of offshore accounts for how the rich and wealthy hide their money. And she was uh, a really integral part of that investigation. Um, and so right now, uh, after she was murdered in 2017, October 2017, uh, the investigation for her death is still ongoing. Okay, and so tell me a little bit about how the investigation into her death is going right now. So right now, uh, in December, they had uh, arrested 10 people in a raid uh, for her death, but according to her sons and her husband, the people who were arrested aren't actually the people who uh, were actually wanting to see her dead, you know? Uh, there were, uh, they were hired according to, is what the family thinks. Uh, so for right now for the family, no real justice has been served and um, that's really all they want to see right now. Okay, and how exactly is the family in particular involved? So uh, they've actually been shut out of the investigation yeah. entirely by the police and uh, that's something that they are in really upset about something that they spoke about uh, last night and um, there are a lot of issues that are going on with the investigation uh, specifically and they have a lot of issues with themselves uh, with it themselves and it's come up in a lot of press uh, whether the press in Malta or nationwide uh, or international. Okay, so tell us a little bit about some of those challenges that they're facing right now. Yeah, so uh, one of the biggest challenges that they talked about last night is that the people who are investigating her are, or who are investigating her death are some of the people that she was investigating while she was a journalist. So these are people that might not, that are definitely not her biggest fans, and the family is feeling that when it comes to the investigation, they're not feeling that it's being given, you know, a fair shake right now. Wow, and I really hope that she gets some justice. Well, thank you so much, Odea, for joining us. I'm Alana Selden here for Mornings on the Hill. Stare to come here on Mornings on the Hill. 2018 class marshals are getting ready for commencement weekend. Here's how the chosen students feel about the tremendous honor. Stay with us for that and much more just ahead. Welcome back here to Mornings on the Hill. And for those seniors out there, believe it or not, it is 40 days until graduation. Hard to believe the year went by so fast for the class of 2018. But for a specific group of seniors that our own Caitlin Pearson got to sit down with, graduation day will hold a particularly special meaning. Caitlin? Two students chosen each year to lead a class of many. As senior class marshals, one of the most prestigious honors at SU, I had the opportunity to talk with a pair of them who say they are ready to share their orange spirit with their entire class. The honor of becoming a senior class marshal for Syracuse University is a year and a half long journey. Middle of spring semester, college lets everyone know that, or at least the the upcoming senior class know that applications are open to be a college marshal. Uh, it was a simple yet challenging uh, application process. So some interviews and I had to write some essays as well, basically explaining what it has meant to me to be a student in Syracuse University. And not just been a student, but, but been someone who has grown throughout their four years and, and really developed who they are. How have I applied what I learned in the classroom for real life and how I have demonstrated that I have challenged myself uh, not just academically, but outside the classroom as well. And as for the responsibilities? Well, we get to carry the banner and guide our class uh, during commencement. And, but it's, it's, it's even more than that. Graduation will take place in the Carrier Dome just behind me. And the boys say that thinking about the upcoming ceremonies brings a new meaning to the phrase forever orange. It means that I have carved out, you know, a sort of segment or, or a sort of a piece of the university that I'll carry with me um, essentially for the rest of my life. It means being part of something that's really big and it makes you feel part of a huge community that's not limited to the grounds of Syracuse University but it's all around the world. And with the skill and passion of these two, the world can hardly wait. While Charles and Andres could not be more excited to represent their class within their respective schools during commencement, 
the senior class marshals for the class of 2019 were announced this past week to inspire future Orange for years to come. Reporting live in studio, Caitlin Pearson, back to you. Lightwork is officially presenting its 2018 Newhouse Photography Annual. The photography organization has chosen more than 25 students in the Newhouse School and will display their work. The exposition is located right across from Watson Theater. The images incorporated various life themes and will be on display until July 27th. Senior Brian Cerillo says the exhibit helps prepare him for, for his career in photojournalism. As a student and near professional, I think that um, it kind of gives me a, a feel of what it's going to be like, hopefully, um, the upcoming years. The exposition is free and open to the public for the next four months. That will do it for us this morning. I'm Alexis Scott. And I'm Maya Owens. Don't go away. I'm Nay and Elisa, and the rest of the team will, back, will be right back. Good morning, I'm Omneya Bushnup. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Melissa Candiati. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our second half hour. With graduation as two weeks away, Syracuse University is ready to welcome this year's commencement speakers. We'll tell you what the selection process is like and what to expect at the ceremony. But many students aren't ready to walk across that stage just yet. The Student Association is introducing new programs to help students prepare for the real world after graduation. And maple syrup season is coming to a close here in central New York, but it experienced a big hiccup this year. How the cold weather this winter took a toll on maple syrup production. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this half hour, graduation is on the horizon for some SU students. And with graduation comes final words of inspiration from commencement and convocation speakers. Liliana Pearson joins us live with more. You've probably noticed flyers and emails encouraging students to prepare for graduation, which is coming up in just a few short weeks. As you get ready to leave campus and enter the workforce, Syracuse is looking to offer some final inspiration. Days after spring break, students are focused on finishing up their semester. But in just over five weeks, some of these students will be filling empty auditoriums for this. Graduation caps off seniors' life as students, and a big part of graduation week is the commencement and convocation speakers. They offer inspiration and experience and possibility. And I think that's what's most exciting about commencement is what comes next. Faulkner said the selection process is different for each institution within Syracuse's campus, but you can usually find a common thread among the many speakers who will be on campus the weekend of May 11th. One thing that we're always looking for in a speaker is a commitment to public service in the broadest possible sense, right? Someone who wants to make a difference in the world. One of the key factors the school looks for when selecting a speaker is relevance. Making sure the person is in tune with the current state of the world. It's relevance, it's connection to the institution to a certain extent, um, but it's also uh, the sort of deeper meaning of what education does for a person. She said the students should leave feeling excited for the future, no matter how rocky the path might end up being. Let it happen. You never know what opportunities might come up. You never know what jobs might come up. And it's important to be ready to seize the opportunity, even though it may not be what you planned. A few schools here on campus have announced their convocation speakers, but there will be more announced in the coming weeks. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Liliana Pearson. And now it's time for another check on your weather for today. Sarah Bondis is live out on the weather deck to show us what to expect. Omnea and Alyssa, I am being blown away by this April weather, quite literally, and that is because there is a high winds warning in effect until midnight tonight, but let's take a look at your five-day weather forecast. Today you can expect a bit of a washout, with rain expected to continue throughout the day. There will be a high of 54 degrees and a low of 25 degrees. Tomorrow the sun will peek through the clouds, but is expected to cool down with a high of 34 and a low of 28. 
Your weekend will have a wintry start with snow and rain expected on Friday with a high of 46 and a low of 28 degrees. Saturday will be cloudy with a high of 39 degrees and a low of 25. And on Sunday, flurries are expected with a high of 34 and a low of 25 degrees. Now, high winds and rain are expected to continue here on and off throughout the day. So if you're headed outdoors, be sure to bring your umbrella. Reporting from University Avenue, I'm Sarah Bonadies. Back to you in the studio. Thanks for that, Sarah. And with the cost of tuition, books, housing, and food, paying for college is a challenge for many students. Sometimes they come up short when it comes to affording essentials like food and basic household supplies. But Hendricks Chapel staff wants those students to know they are here to help. The Chapel's Food Pantry serves Syracuse University and SUNY ESF students who are in need of assistance paying for food and, basic -like and basics like toiletries. Located in the basement of Hendricks Chapel, the Food Pantry supplies are donations from students, faculty, staff, and the surrounding community. And for some students, the Food Pantry means they don't have to choose between paying tuition and paying for food. And I'm ready to leave. It cuts costs for people who really are struggling to pay, pay with school and stuff like that, so to be able to get groceries each week it's, uh, it's really helpful. The food pantry is located in the lower level of Hendricks Chapel and is open Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m., Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 7.30 p.m. Some students graduate from college with a lot of knowledge, and yet they also feel that they know nothing about dealing with life as an adult. The Student Association has an event for that. They are partnering with a couple of other programs to ensure that students understand financial literacy, home buying, and more. Hopefully a sophomore or a junior or maybe even a freshman sees these resources now and says, oh, when I'm in my senior year, instead of me just finding out about this now in my second half of my second semester, says, oh, I'll look into that my junior year. Franco wants to continue the tradition for many more years to come. The event will take place April 9th through the 12th and is open to all students. And the students running to be the next leaders of the SU Student Association held their first debate earlier this week. The candidates discussed several issues of concern to the SU student community. The candidates were Comptroller, Vice President, and President talked about SU's tuition increase and the need for more diversity and accessibility on campus. It was an interactive debate with the candidates fielding questions from the moderator as well as from students on Twitter. Those in attendance encouraged their fellow students to get out there and vote. The only way that you can really make sure that you're leaving the impact here on campus that you want to is to connect with those officials and, and really put the ones that connect with you most into office. The Student Association elections will take place next Monday through Thursday, April 9th through April 12th. And Ted... TEDx is a student club at Syracuse University that was predicted to fold in the beginning of the club at Syracuse University, whose main goal is to spread important ideas throughout its community. After running five years strong, it was expected to dwindle away at the start of the semester after many of its seniors left. However, two of its members were able to pull the organization together and rebuild it from the ground up. We banded together and we were like, all right, we really need to like recruit a new team. So we released an application, we tabled at the iSchool Club Fair, and then we had interviews and we recruited a bunch of new people to join our team. I'm standing inside of the iSchool where TEDx has their weekly meetings. The theme of the club revolves around the meaning of the word now. So co-led organizer and executive producer Chris Sekarak is going to tell me why that is and what it means. Our topics are wide ranging. They vary from entrepreneurial in nature to very deep emotional issues and essentially they just have something to do with that present moment that they're being delivered and also the moment in which the audience views it. The club's social media coordinator Ashley Steinberg also tells us what she hopes the audience will gain from going to their event. I want people from this conference to learn something that changes their perspective on a topic that they once thought of. On the Hill, our Billy Owens will sit down with the coordinator of the English Language Institute, who's working to make Syracuse University a home away from home for international students. Also coming up through exercise and wellness, the Panhellenic community is finding new ways to come together. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill.
Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. I'm Billy Owens. We're joined this morning with Jackie Monsor, who is the Coordinator of Admissions and Student Services at the English Language Institute here at Syracuse University. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Of course. So before we begin, can you just tell us a little bit more about the English Language Institute and why is it so important here at Syracuse University? The English Language Institute provides English instruction for and assists people in reaching their goals, whether they need academic English or English for their jobs. Okay, so I know that the English Language Institute is geared more towards international students and that earlier in the semester, you guys were looking for students here on SU's campus to be volunteers to bring in those students to host a meal. So where did that concept originate and how is it going? It's going really well. It originated um, we started doing it over the semester break. Now, many of our students don't travel over the break, so we um, seeked out volunteers and um, university community members, not just students, to uh, host these students in their home for a meal. And they, both the students and the host enjoyed it so much that we decided that we should do this all year long. So this, is, this semester we started doing it again. We've already had four students be welcomed into a home the semester and we've got uh, several more that are interested so we're going to try to get that done before the end of this month um, and then we expect to do this every semester going forward. Great I know that food always is a way to bring everyone together so I'm sure that's going to continue and get better and better as the year goes on. So in regards to uh, English Language Institute I know that you guys host other events and special like bonding uh, ceremonies too. Um, get the students all together. So what are some of those other events that you guys do put on? Well, at the ELI, um, we're, we're kind of um, all together and it, our students kind of are isolated. So we do our best to bring them out to the community. We have a mentor program where we have upper level SU students who have traveled abroad themselves um, be mentors for our students and um, invite them and encourage them to do activities both inside and outside campus. Um, we have a conversation group program where we have volunteers from the community come in and spend about 30 to 45 minutes a week with our students and kind of assist them with um, practice on their conversational English in a less st uh, structured environment than the classroom is. Um, we also have a student council who are elected members for each class and the purpose of the, um, the members, their, their goal is to also encourage students to do activities both on and off campus. So, and we work closely with the Slusker Center. Um, they do have a mix it up once a month or so, and we encourage our students to join that as well. And um, domestic students and international students are both encouraged to participate in that. That's great, because I know that when most people think of different mentorship programs here on campus, they think it's geared more towards underclassmen and freshmen. So it's important that these international students do get a person to, that they can ask for just for the little exactly. things. And, it's, and they meet for coffee. It could just be a one-on-one -on -one at times as well. Maybe they just need somebody to kind of walk them through things. So great. It's, it's helpful. So if a student isn't involved in the special mentorship program or the student council that you even have. So what are some other ways that we can get involved with the English Language Institute if we're not already? Well, the host program, of course, you know, we, we're always looking for people that are willing to welcome our students in that way. Um, it's, it's always a challenge um, because many of our students um, self-select to be with their own group and we do our best to try to encourage them to step out of their comfort zone a little bit and um, to try new things. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jackie. Back to you guys at the news desk. Women from the Panhellenic community are coming together on campus through exercise. A boot camp workout class was offered to women of different sorority chapters to promote women empowerment and wellness. Personal trainer Paul Bamba traveled to Syracuse and led three different hour-long training sessions. Each of them incorporated cardio and HIIT training. The event was the last of a month-long series focused on the Panhellenic community's strength and growth. Many who attended the workout set up to step in the direction the Greek, for the Greek life community on campus. Come meet with each other with low pressure and it's just a fun way to um, exercise. The Panhellenic community hopes to continue hosting wellness events in the future. And maple syrup season is just about over here in central New York. The season typically runs from late February until early April. That's when the temperatures are right for maple syrup production. However, this winter's extremely cold temperatures made it difficult for maple syrup farms to produce as much syrup as usual. It'll be a little less 
syrup than usual, both because of the uh, seed year last year and also because of the cold weather in March. Carl Wiles is the owner of Cedar Vale Maple Syrup Company in Syracuse. He says a reason why cold temperatures makes maple syrup production difficult is because it requires sap to be collected from the maple trees. But if the temperatures are too cold, the sap freezes and prevents everyone's favorite pancake topping from being made. Despite this year's cold temperatures, Wiles still expects the maple farm to produce at least 650 gallons of syrup. Good morning, I'm Zach Staten with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. And we're officially out of the month of March, which unfortunately brings an end to March Madness. But the Syracuse men's basketball team's surprising trip to the Sweet 16 brought a high level of spirit to campus. Our Alana Selden has more on how the team's tournament run brought much more than madness to Syracuse. Will and I were probably in the car. Maybe we made it! It was absolutely ridiculous. Something like 13 yeah. of the last like 15 or 16 days. Day into Detroit and then all the way to Omaha, Dudley followed the orange to every contest in the NCAA tournament. I don't know when I'll recover my sleep, um, but at the end of the day, it was it was so worth it. SU's last minute entry into the big dance and Cinderella run to the Sweet 16 brought some much needed school spirit to the hill. It really like brought the community together because that was like one thing that everyone on campus ha had in common. Like everyone was rooting for Syracuse. It's a piece of history. It's it's uh, it was a little unexpected, and that makes it even more sweeter. The unexpected performance by the Orange also skyrocketed T-shirt sales for businesses like Manny's. Like the Cuse mode, the white T-shirt uh, wasn't even here a day, and it was gone. With shirts flying off the rack, Manny's pre-ordered shirts for the Elite Eight, Final Four, and National Championship, just in case. Even if we weren't sure the team was going to even make the tournament, people expect things from you. We're not a regular retail store. Stuff is in high demand and, and you have to have it here the next day. And although the Orange didn't seal the deal in the dance, Nestor says at least they made it and Manny's will be selling Sweet 16 shirts all the way through graduation. Gotta do that for the fans. You can't just say, oh, we lost the Sweet 16, we're out of it. That's our Alana Selda reporting for Mornings on the Hill. The tournament ended Monday night with Villanova collecting its second championship in three seasons after a victory over the Michigan Wolverines. After dropping two straight games to top 20 opponents, the Syracuse men's lacrosse team have defeated two top 10 programs in back-to-back -back games, including picking up win number 900 for the program with a 10-6 win over sixth-ranked Notre Dame. They shot for win number 901 last night inside the Dome as they took on in-state rival Hobart. And with just one day to prepare, SU attackman Steven Rafus notched his second hat-trick of the season as the Orange retained the Kraus Simmons Trophy for the 30th time in 33 attempts. Final score, 11 goals to four. Cuse took 19 shots on goal and forced 16 turnovers and holding Hobart to their lowest scoring effort of the season. And goalie Don Madonna had something to do with that. He saved nine shots in 56 minutes of work and picked up the W. It's their third win in a row and afterwards head coach John Desco lauded his team's ability to start so well after a short turnaround. Uh, the game didn't go exactly how I thought it would. I thought that uh, with only a day to prepare Monday that we might get off to a, a little shakier start uh, in the first quarter and uh, to my surprise we came out and uh, I thought we played pretty well. Now at 6-3 overall, the Orange get a well-earned week off before heading to Ithaca to take on 13th ranked Cornell, another in-state rival for Syracuse. And one final note, the SU softball team has a home doubleheader today. They'll take on Canisius at Skytop Softball Stadium. First game starting at noon with the second one slated to start at 2 p.m. This is just the team's second home series of the year, so definitely want to get out and check out the softball team. That's your sports update. I'm Zach Staten, but don't go anywhere. Still a lot to come after the break. Syracuse students are teaming up with the local children's chorus for a special concert. That plus what's coming up this weekend on the Hill. That's more to come. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back and thanks for sticking with us. The Setner School of Music is having a concert tonight at 8 p.m. Our own Epiphany Catling joins us now with a story. Thanks, Omne and Alyssa. SU singers and Syracuse Children's Chorus are coming together for a performance tonight. I had a chance to attend one of the rehearsals and speak with the conductor. The Setner School of Music is hosting a collaborative concert featuring the SU singers and the Syracuse Children's Chorus. And they had little time to put this show together. 
So we would have started at the beginning of classes in January, like 10 weeks or something like that. The Children's Chorus comes to Syracuse University multiple times a week. We think singing is a great activity and way to be involved in the community and so anything we can do to, to help enhance the experience for the children is, is great. During the concert, you'll hear multiple styles of music. The music is widely varied, so hopefully something for everybody. Featured in the concert will be the world premiere of Fragmentary Blue by Tevi Abair, the winner of the Greg Smith's Choral Competition. Abair is coming from New York City to introduce his piece. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a very good experience. Uh, because we're not dependent on somebody else's interpretation or listening to a previous performance or anything like that, we get to do it the first time. Another song called Let My Love Be Heard by Jake Runstan was written after the Paris bombings. Student leader Margaret will introduce this piece with her feelings about the recent tragedies that are happening in the U.S. You know, do we want to embrace this idea of can we use this piece as an expression of grief and of, and of hope and, and moving on? Tonight's performance is at 8 p.m. and admission is free and there is free parking at the Q1 parking lot. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Epiphany Catling. Hey guys, we have a lot going on this weekend, so let's check out what we have going on from Thursday through Sunday. Tomorrow kicks off Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders Month in Schaefer Art Building where you can enjoy food and the movie Vincent Who while mingling with students, faculty, and staff. The event starts at 6.30 p.m. Fusion will have a discussion group meeting at 6 p.m. and Chelsea Handler will be speaking in Goldstein Auditorium at 8 p.m. Tickets are $5 in the box office. Also, University Union will present the film Proud Mary in Gifford Auditorium at 8 p.m. On Friday, it kicks off with the 15th annual Whitman Day with featured, speecher, featured speakers in the Marvin and Helene Lender Auditorium. There will be Feel Good Friday health and wellness events such as Zumba, journaling, and meditations starting at noon in, Shine, in the Shine Student Center and Bird Library. Orange After Dark will have a paint night in the Sheraton Hotel Ballroom. Tickets are still available in the Shine box office for $3. The doors open at 9.30. On Saturday, start your morning off at the annual garage sale at Fayetteville Manulis High School starting at 8 a.m. Gifford Auditorium will also be screening Insidious, the last key at 11 p.m. Sunday, there will be a Dean's Convocation at Hendricks Chapel. This weekly service will run every Sunday until April 29th. And that's Weekends on the Hill for this week. I'm Gianna Astorito. So have you ever had a professor make you dance in class? And I don't mean in dance class. It's I mean, <laughs> that's crazy. It's not something I've experienced before, but yeah, students at Kaiser University in Tampa might have experienced this. One professor makes any student who is late to class dance in front of their peers. This video went viral and as of this morning had 11.2 million views on Twitter. Well, that's pretty. That's that's actually pretty wild. I've never seen anything it's like that before. Not to be late to class. That's true. Do you think that a lot of people are like, you know, what? I kind of want to dance. Maybe I will do something crazy or the, and be late. Or do you think you'd be like, Honestly, I never want to be it late? Depends on how big the lecture is. Yeah, like, I don't think I want to be late. I don't know. Yeah, I, that, I feel like I personally would not. It looks like a smaller class, but if it was a lecture, I think it would definitely be incentive yeah. not to come late. Yes. I've personally haven't seen anything like this in person. The only thing is, I've had professors lock the door once class starts and not let people in. Tell people to stand for a while, you know, as a punishment. I feel like yeah. some people might take it in a lighthearted way, you know, yeah. give it away, you know, to like make I the class I actually had a professor, I wore an Ohio State t-shirt to class and he was like, nope, I'm a Texas fan, you gotta go outside. So I had to like <laughs> oh, take my, my math goodness. homework and everything like outside and do it. <laughs> I was in middle crazy. school, so I was so confused. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is at least, at the minimum, sparked my idea that if I was a professor, what would I do? I think that even if I'm not in Syracuse anymore, I'd make my students sing the Syracuse alma mater. I'd be like, you gotta do it, stand up, do it. What would you That's ladies do if you were That's a professor? Fair. Honestly, I kind of like the dancing idea. You know, give a little eight count, you know, make the class stand up. I don't know, I feel like it's two kind step. of like a light, lighthearted way, <laughs> yeah. you know, lead the class. But at the same time, I think it's supposed to be a punishment, so maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this Wednesday here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Omneya Bushnab. Be sure to follow us on all social media. And I'm Melissa Candiotti. Thanks for watching, RN Nation.